ASMR. In tonight's video, we're going to be doing a mock draft review. That is right, I did yet another ESPN Fantasy Football mock draft. This time a 12-team league, full PPR once again, and uh, yeah, the results are out. I did this earlier today, and I wanted to go through round by round, explaining all of my selections, my thoughts and analysis on these players, why I made the pick, why I like the pick, and a couple cases why I don't really like the pick, and yeah, just general advice for your mock drafts this year. So, if you enjoy fantasy football, and if you are intending on playing, then uh, you've come to the right place. So please, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So, this is a 12-team PPR league, as I described, and I was picking from the number 4 spot in this draft, and this was a snake draft, so with my first pick in this draft, I opted to go for running back off of the New York Jets, Brees Hall, and Brees Hall, I am all in on him in 2024, and the reason for that being, if you take a look at his age, how he did last year, and just the current state of the New York Jets, Brees Hall last year finished as the overall running back two in fantasy football, uh, only behind Christian McCaffrey. He is entering his third year primed for, you know, a RB fantasy one type season. Uh, fantasy RB one type season, I mean. And uh, in the receiving game, he was number one of, out of all running backs in the league. He had the most targets, he had the most catches, beating out even Christian McCaffrey, some of those other guys at the top of the list. Uh, and that is very impressive. And so you take everything that you know about Brees Hall last year, and then you factor in the fact that they are going to be a much improved offense this next year under Aaron Rodgers. You know, he was doing all of that even in his rookie year before he went down with injury of the ACL there. He was having a very nice year, and that was with Zach Wilson. And then he comes back in year two, does phenomenally, and that's also with Zach Wilson. So now we're going to see a Jets offense that can actually consistently move the ball down the field. It's going to be in much more goal line situations, meaning more touchdowns for Brees Hall, more opportunities around the red zone. And while I think his targets and catches do dip a little bit, um, just because Zach Wilson can't really throw the ball, really relied on the bailout passes, uh, and Rodgers is less so that kind of quarterback, but Aaron Rodgers is also getting older. This is going to be the least mobile he's ever been. I'm age 40, just coming off a major injury. He might be looking for the bailout pass as well. You know, he's a very smart quarterback. He's either going to throw it out of bounds or he's going to dump it off to his very talented running back. And just as a receiver, Brees Hall is one of the best receiving backs there is in the league. So at number four, more than happy to take him. I honestly think that he has the best shot as finishing as the overall RB1 this year. Uh, consensus ADP on the first three running backs off the board is Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, and Bijan Robinson. Bijan, you know, it's a new offensive coordinator. Uh, it's a new quarterback. He's still Tyler Algier could still be in the picture. While he is a very talented back, there are a lot of question marks surrounding him. And then with Christian McCaffrey, there's not really any question marks. You know what you're getting. He's a beast. It's just the fact that, you know, no running back has repeated as number one overall um, in back-to-back -back years. He could be the first. Um, and, yeah, it's fully possible Christian McCaffrey is an absolute beast. But of these three guys, I do like Brees Hall as the best long-term pick for season-wide outlook. So, yeah, round one, Brees Hall. Picking him up off the way 
was throwing to him. It's Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford is known to be able to support very viable fantasy wide receiving options. And I'm not just talking about those historic record breaking seasons with Calvin Johnson and Cooper Cup that did both occur under Matthew Stafford and last year's Bukunakua season. But just in general, you take a look at his last couple seasons. Last year he had Bukunakua breakout year. Two years ago he was injured, so let's not look at that. Three years ago, Cooper Cup triple crown year. Then the year before that, 2020, when he was in Detroit, he, um, let's, let's go back another year or two before that, um, so 2020, 2019, 2018, 2018, Kenny Galladay was a wide receiver two, uh, finished as, like, in the 20s or late teens in the overall wide receiver finishes, so Kenny Galladay Overall, he's a wide receiver, too, at the end of the year, which is pretty good, you know, finishing in that top 24. And then Matthew Stafford only plays half the season, but Kenny Galladay breaks out. And so by the 2019 season, Kenny Galladay, wide receiver, one option. And then goes to the Giants. No more Kenny Galladay for the Lions. But even then, Matthew Stafford is able to take a 30-year-old Marvin Jones Jr. and make him wide receiver 18 on the year which is fantastic considering how Marvin Jones I I believe it was 18 let's let's just double check that real quick I want to make sure I'm getting my years right let's see 2018 we've got wide receiver not tight end yes as the wide receiver 21. Then 2019, Kenny Galladay finishes as the wide receiver 9 with Stafford playing half that year. 2020, Stafford is back. Kenny Galladay is back. Or is gone off the Lions. Yes, we've got Marvin Jones Jr. as the wide receiver 18 at the end of the year, averaging 14.2 points at age 30. Uh, this includes some very big games, 23.6 points, 25.6 points, 27.2 points, 38 points, 18.9 points, and it's not like the rest of his weeks were horrible. He was putting up pretty solid numbers week in and week out. After week 7, it looks like he had a stretch where his worst game was 9 points, and honestly, that's very solid, uh, especially from an older guy, so I think the floor draft and Matthew Stafford wide receiver the best wide receiver on his team at that time he's going to give you at worst a wide receiver to uh, finish in with that guy so Bukunakua I think on the depth chart he has jumped Cooper Cup Cooper Cup fantastic season two years ago but dealt with injuries last year dealt with injuries a little bit the year before uh, he's just now he's age 30, 31. Let's double check that as well while we're at it. Yeah, 31 years old. Wow, my shoulders. Um, it's, it's possible, you know, like once wide receivers hit past age 30 season, they do tend to regress. It's not going to be the same. I'm not saying that he can't have another good year, but if I'm taking a chance on either of these two guys, I'm going with the younger, stronger, faster Bukunakua, who just had an all-around amazing year, and yeah, with that Bukunakua around too, very happy with that pick as well. Shifting gears into round three, third round of this 12-man PPR draft, I went with running back of the New Orleans Saints, Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara, I feel like, had an underrated season last year. Uh, I don't recall talking about him 
is averaging 17.9 points per game, which is good enough for third in the league behind Christian McCaffrey and Kyron Williams. Now, there are some things to worry about. Calvin Alvin Kamara is getting up there with age, um, and, you know, the running back position is the one that sees the most volatility, has the shortest average lifespan of any position in football, but... I think the thing that is the most promising with Alvin Kamara is his targets per game and his, you know, usage in the running game, uh, in the passing, pass-catching game. Um, if we look at how many targets total running backs had last year, Alvin Kamara was tied for second with Bijan Robinson. Riesel was first with 95 total targets, but Bijan, sorry, yeah, Riesel was number one with 95. Bijan and Alvin Kamara both tied with 86, but both of those other guys played all of their games. So, at the end of the year, it was actually Alvin Kamara by far and away with the most targets per game. Breesaw was second in the league with 5.6 targets per game. Alvin Kamara out-targeted him by a full target, 6.6 .6 targets per game. That is a crazy amount of volume in the passing game. And considering that this is PPR full point PPR, you have to take advantage of that kind of, you know, prospective catches. Uh, I think that he is going to go for at least 60 catches, um, you know, pretty sure-handed, very good. I think he's still going to be a very good receiving back. Uh, last year, Ken Miller, they drafted him. He wasn't the most healthy. He didn't really cut into Alvin Kamara's role. I think that Kamara still has good football left in him, and I think that it's possible the Saints are a little... I don't know if they're going to be better on offense. I know that they're revamping the offense for the first time since Sean Payton was there in the building, so it's going to be different. Maybe it's going to be simplified. Maybe it's going to be easier. That could allow for Kamara to have a nice role, uh, Derek Carr to be slightly better, but yeah, I'm not really viewing Kamara as a guy who's going to necessarily get a lot of touchdowns or a ton of rushing yards, but I think that his value in the passing game is big, uh, and he provides a level of upside not many of the other backs in the league do, so I'm happy with it, I, I'm more than happy with him in the third round. Jamar 
energies, Justin Jefferson, the easy ones off the bat. Prior to them, you also had Odell, Jarvis Landry, uh, DJ Turk had a Pro Bowl year. These are all LSU guys. And then the thing that's like most attractive about Malik Neighbors' upside is one his like athleticism. He tested amazing in the combine. All the all the footage and feedback from camp has been very positive. But the year that he had last year at LSU, they went for fifteen hundred yards and double digit touchdowns. And then where he got drafted he got drafted in the upper half of the first round. There's only been a few wide receivers with that kind of pull of uh, first round LSU wide receiver pull. And that would be Jamar Chase, Odell Beckham Jr., and Justin Jefferson, and all three of those guys hit. And if you really go back, it even goes back to Dwayne Bowie, uh, and he was also Pro Bowl level, you know, wide receiver. So LSU first receive, first round wide receivers do typically do well. Everything I've seen about Malik Neighbors has been positive. I don't love Daniel Jones uh, and his ability to support high high end wide receivers. I just have not seen it. I think he had a decent tight end. Not with Darren Waller, but maybe I want to say that Evan Ingram had a pretty solid year in New York before he went to the Jaguars with Daniel Jones. Um, and with Daniel Jones, we just have to hope that he can get the ball in the right place for neighbors. I think even if he puts it slightly in the wrong place, neighbors is talented enough that he can go out there and snatch it out of the air over the defender. Um, him as a prospect, just astounding. We'll see if he can overcome his situation. But, yeah, uh, really speaking of the rookie wide receiver class to bet on, Similar logic applies to Brian Thomas Jr. Obviously, Brian Thomas Jr. less talked about, not as high draft capital. Uh, his tangibles don't pop off the the combine sheet as much, but Brian Thomas Jr. could also be very productive first round wide receiver. And then I think obviously Marvin Harrison Jr. is a dog. He, I, I think that he is for sure going to do very well in the NFL. Neighbors. I don't know as much. I am more betting, risking on neighbors. Whereas Harrison, I feel like, is a very polished and clean prospect. Uh, just as far as they go, you don't hear about people years on in advance without them being great. Like, take for example, Victor Wembanyama. You heard about him for probably two or three years before he ever got drafted. Uh, NBA reference, but even then, uh, Cooper Flag, he hasn't, he's been in high school and now he's going into college. You already know about him. I feel like Marvin Harrison Jr., I had, I've, I've heard about him for years on end now, so there's no doubt in my mind that he will be the most productive rookie after him. I do think that Neighbors has a shot at that, but we'll see. Receiver three value in the third round. The thing about George Pickens. 
ones that I think is a little bit better this year. Obviously, he's got another year to develop. Um, one, I think, depth chart. You get rid of Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson was more talented. He was the better wide receiver. Um, and so, him going to Carolina, I think they are putting more of their eggs in George Pickens' basket. And behind him, there's not a lot of people that would command targets on that offense. I think Pat Fryermuth is solid. He would get his fair share. And after that, you've got Van Jefferson, who really is more like a wide receiver three, wide receiver four, in my opinion. Um, but he's wide receiver two on their depth chart. You've got Calvin Austin, who can have some nice plays here and there, but just have not seen anything that great out of him. I think he does have a better year this year. And then, yeah, after you go past those three, I think the next person that would even, I don't even know if he's going to make the roster, uh, you've got Scotty Miller. Uh, so, yeah, uh, George Pickens, back on away, the best wide receiver option on this offense. And just comparing his numbers from last year to this year, I do think that his quarterback situation has gotten better. Uh, we're going from Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett is not a name that I is not a quarterback that puts up good stats, uh, especially for fantasy. I mean, he is good enough that he's not losing you every single week, but I don't think that he ever really panned out. Couldn't really throw the ball all that well. Um, and then you've got a guy in Russell Wilson who I'm sure some people hate him. Some people are hating on him. But he's a lot better than who they're rolling out with last year. Mitch Trubisky, uh, Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph. Like, Russell Wilson is a definite step up from any of those guys. And so for George Pickens to be a wide receiver three with them, stepping in at the situation where Russell Wilson is probably going to come in and start and hopefully keep the job, uh, I think that he definitely is higher up more like a wide receiver two finish. I don't think that he has wide receiver one upside, but I feel like he has a strong case for a wide receiver two finish as the best receiver on that team, and they'll be looking to compete. Um, yeah. Then, after that, we move into round six. receiver, but this time off of the Washington Commanders. This is Terry McLaurin, uh, and the reason that I did this went two running backs and then four wide receivers in my first six rounds, uh, just in case I, I feel like I like Bukunakua as my first pick. Neighbors is a bit more risky, uh, Pickens. Uh, I went with Bukunakua. I'm very solid. I confidence in him. Malik Neighbors has a high ceiling, but also a low floor, I feel like. Um, as a guy, like, I just don't know how good the Giants are going to be. I don't know what his season really looks like. So I went with two guys who have a bit of a safer floor, in my opinion. One in George Pickens and two in Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin finished right behind George Pickens last year as the wide receiver 31. Also cracks that top 36 very productive, very consistent guy, where he's going to give you at least a thousand yards, probably like 50 catches, um, and so you can trust them enough, but I think that this year he also is benefiting from a better quarterback situation. Terry McLaurin has done it with some really poor quarterback play. It's kind of like DeAndre Hopkins early in his career, uh, not quite at that eye-popping level, more like a Mike Evans, where Jameis Winston, some of those other guys. Jameis was more of a gunslinger. But, yeah, Terry McLaurin, great start to his career in terms of consistency, and I do think that he's going to be in the best quarterback situation he's been in thus far. I'm expecting uh, good things from Jane Daniels, and along with that, I also don't think that the other commanders, receivers, are going to do all that much. Um, to take away from Terry, you know, you've got, like, Deami Brown, John Dodson, uh, is there any 
someone else. There could be one more guy that I'm forgetting, but Terry McLaurin, I think, sits a league above the rest of them. He's well-renowned, he is respected, and I think he's about to get a big improvement in the quarterback department. So, his floor is a wide receiver three, and I think potential is higher. So, two. You know, some people, they say, don't bet on the floor, bet on the ceiling when it comes to fantasy football. And while in in practice, I do agree with that more often. I, I bet on the ceiling on my like neighbors, and now I'm just making up for it. So there's that. Then after that, we move into round seven. This is round number seven of this draft. And here I decided to go with tight end of the San Francisco 49ers.
is selecting quarterback of the Washington Commanders, Jaden Daniels. Now, Jaden Daniels, I think, is going to have a fantastic year in fantasy. Um, the biggest reason for that is his dual threat ability. He can run and he can pass. Uh, we saw this last year at LSU. He won the Heisman Trophy, and that was no fluke was throwing for over 300 yards a game and rushing for nearly 100 yards a game. I believe it came out to 90. Uh, and when you look at his stats and quarterbacks of his stature entering the league, taking over as like a dual threat quarterback, when the Heisman comes into the league, uh, you've got Cam Newton, you've got Kyler Murray, and you've got Lamar Jackson. Now, of those guys, Lamar Jackson did not start right away. Uh, once he was given the keys to the team, they started winning a lot first, but also then he had a very good year. Uh, and then after that, and he did it with like not that much talent, Cam Newton instantly had a top top five fantasy finish. Uh, Kyler Murray, same thing. And the thing that is most similar about Jane Daniel's situation and Kyler Murray's situation is the coach. Uh, coach Cliff Kingsbury was the guy in charge when the Cardinals drafted Kyler Murray, and now he is going to be on this Washington, Washington Commanders coaching staff, and so what I'm thinking is you can expect, like, at least five rushes per game for Jaden Daniels, uh, whether these are design rushes or him just scrambling out of the pocket and into the open field, um, and yeah, his preseason debut, he already looked great, threw a 40 yard bomb, rushed in for a touchdown, so I think that his dual threat ability is very, very alluring, and so I did wait until the 8th round before grabbing him, for me, in terms of value for quarterback, it's, you want to get the dual threat guy, uh, it is really preferred, uh, you can get away with just having very good elite type quarterbacks, like if you can walk away with a Joe Burrow, a Justin Herbert, a Dak Prescott, all of those guys, you're confident in their throwing ability, I feel like they'll throw for a decent number of touchdowns, have a good year, throw for 4,000 yards, they're all fine. Um, Patrick Mahomes is not exactly the same, he exists in a caliber of his own, where, yeah, he's not exactly a rushing quarterback, but you're expecting him to throw for a lot and for a lot of touchdowns. I don't know why fireworks are going off on August 13th. I hope that it's not too loud and intrusive, but I'll see. Uh, anywho, but yeah, as far as like rushing quarterbacks go, we've got Anthony Richardson, we've got Jalen Hurts, we've got Josh Allen, we've got Jaden Daniels, Kyle Murray, uh, Lamar Jackson, of course. These are guys that are like premier picks in fantasy football. And then if you're just looking at value, where they can finish, they're most likely going to finish very high. But the the price point on Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, it's it's much higher. You're gonna have to invest like a third, fourth, fifth on them. Whereas you can wait until the seventh and probably grab Kyler Murray, and that is my most like ideal situation. If I don't get Kyler Murray, I do feel like I have to get Jaden Daniels because I want that dual threat ability. If I don't end up with either, I'm more so hoping that a guy that I like is still around there. Uh, I wouldn't say put all your money in Jaden Daniels. Definitely try and aim around six, seventh round pick. out on him, go for Jane, but those are two very promising quarterbacks for this year, I feel like, very good value. Then, in round nine, uh, this is, <laughs> you know, kind of continuing my trend of rookies so far in this draft, uh, starting a string, actually. Wide receiver Keon Coleman, and there's not any particular reason I picked up Keon Coleman. Um, 
was to make a decision. I was looking at who was around. Didn't love the options at wide receiver. I already got tight end. Just picked up my quarterback. And running back also was bleak. I feel like, at least in 12 team, after the 6th round, running back is atrocious. Oh, it is very rough out there. Fourth. Fourth is a little bit hard for me to pick from. I do need to do more 12 team drafts just because I I get too in my head about reaching. I would rather have a player that I feel like I reach for than someone I don't care for on my roster. Um, and so I need to stop just like sticking to the ADP so hard and trying to draft whoever's high up on the board uh, because I don't always love the players. Keon Coleman, I don't think there's anything wrong with him. Uh, that Bill's wide receiver group does not have a clearly established top dog. Um, it's a mixed bag of Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, and Khalil Shakir. I do like Khalil Shakir the best out of that group and I think his added ADP is lower than Keon Coleman's and so it doesn't really make sense for me to pick up Coleman just because yeah, he hasn't played an NFL snap before. Um, was not a first round draft pick. Uh, the Bills do need someone to catch the ball for them. And Curtis Samuel, it's said that he'll have like a Debo Samuel type role. I feel like we've heard that before. It's not always true. Uh, and then Shaker, he was sneakily very good last year in terms of efficiency and him taking over in like the slot. He was pretty nice, and I think that he ends up winning out a lot of those targets vacated by Gabe Davis and Stephon Diggs. Um, I would say I like Keon Coleman. His practical upside more than Curtis Samuel. Curtis Samuel is always like a Trojan horse after that one year in Carolina where he did well. It's always like, you should draft Curtis Samuel. He's going to do all these great things, and then he just does it. I like Every year I've been like kind of high on him and then sometimes I end up with him, sometimes I don't and he just does not deliver. So I'm out on Curtis Samuel. I am not buying into the hype anymore. Coleman, he could be good. Um, as I was saying before, it doesn't hurt too bad on wide receivers. Um, rookie wide receivers, someone's going to pop out for sure and it's not necessarily just the first round ones. It's an okay pick. After that, heading into round 10, we continue with this rookie rampage, selecting quarterback of the Chicago Bears, Caleb Williams. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, just going back real quick, uh, part of the reason I also took Terry McLaurin is because I knew I was going to maybe pick up Jaden Daniels, and so I do like that double up feature. Uh, when you have like the premier wide receiver on team and their quarterback, if you play them both, you get the double of the touchdown points. It's kind of nice. Um, anywho, as I was saying, Caleb Williams in round 10. Uh, and yeah, uh, Caleb Williams two years ago won the Heisman was a very good passer at USC. Uh, he's not He's not a dual threat quarterback, but he is a playmaker. He can scramble, he can make throws on the run, he can make them in the pocket. I think that he's a very talented passer. And if you look at his two years at USC, he had double digit rushing touchdowns in both years. So I might see the Bears try and do that. I think that they are going to be a little more careful. Um, but he's a very sneaky guy. I think that around the goal line, he, we could see some trick trick runs where he goes out and runs it in himself and he's in a prime spot to succeed. Um, Chicago's offensive line is actually not that bad. We, not that bad is putting it lightly. It's, it's hard for me to praise Chicago but they have a very solid offensive line and we've got three talented wide receivers on that group. Roma Duns off of Washington Keenan Allen that they just acquired uh, coming off of a very good year, and then DJ Moore, who is in the midst of his prime, I would say. Uh, so, lots of mouths that he can feed. Realistic 
can be successful from day one. I don't know how much you will take care of that opportunity if you will take advantage of it, but uh, since I'm betting on all these rookies, may as well just throw another one in the batch. I think that Jaden Daniels, I do like his upside a lot more, but one of these two guys, one of these top two picks is bound to hit, so since I'm going all in on the rookie in the ninth, in the eighth round, may as well just pick up another rookie quarterback in round ten, see which one works out. Uh, I, I don't mind. Then. In round eleven, our next rookie is one that I've picked up before in my previous mock draft, my ten team mock. This is running back of the Green Bay Packers, Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd. Another guy that, like, he's not going to have an immediate day one impact. He, at best, is splitting touches with Josh Jacobs. Uh, you have to go back to May, but Matt LaFleur was talking about how he does like to have a couple guys involved with more of, like, an alpha A1 um, guy running the show, with that being you know, Aaron Jones back then, now it's going to be Josh Jacobs, and so Marshawn Lloyd, I think, with A.J. Dillon being on the out, um, his way out of Green Bay, I think, uh, Lloyd is most likely primed for that, and Lloyd, he, this pick is not as good after the preseason game, I did not realize that he suffered an injury, and now Michael Fleur is being, you know, uh, dodgy, cryptic about his timetable for return. It was a hamstring injury. Not ideal for your running back. Um, and so for a guy who you're really drafting as a handcuff, it's fine. But if Josh Jacobs goes down early and he can't go in, then the backfield just goes to someone else and this pick is gone uh, to waste, basically. So he's more of a guy who I think has the tools to succeed in his one season at USC. He was extremely efficient over seven yards um, per carry on USC, and he wasn't all that involved in the receiving game, just 13 catches across 11 games, but when he did catch the ball, uh, he could do a lot with it, averaged over 17 yards per catch, uh, a lot of that was after the catch, I believe, um, might have to fact check me on that, I, I, um, I'm pulling that out of my ass, I will admit, but he is someone that I think is worth looking into for these later rounds where you're not going to find someone who's getting consistent playing time, but as a handcuff, he's not bad. Um, so yeah, Marjan Lloyd, round 11. I'm okay with the pick. I feel like I was higher up on it a couple weeks ago um, when it wasn't my... What is this? My running back three? Yeah. Um, after my first two running backs, my running back room does take a big dip, but it's 12 team. I haven't practiced as much. I'll do better next time. Then in round 12. Round 12 of this mock drive, we've got Cole Kmet, tight end of the Chicago Bears. solid year last year. Finished as the number eight tight end overall. Which is, tight end is a weak position. I It's not a guy that I would recommend going out and getting as your main guy, but as a backup, fine. Uh, if Caleb Williams does break out, have a great year. Obviously, there are very many mouths to feed, but from what I've heard so far, um, with Shane Waldron, Shane Waldron was the offensive coordinator back in Seattle. He's made his way over to Chicago now. He's going to be part of that development for Caleb Williams. He likes to run the uh, 12-man personnel, and so that's two wide receiver sets. And with that, you've got Roma Duns not being on the field. That's just something that I saw recently. Roma Duns taking that back backseat spot to the two vets in DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, and this is not that surprising because Jane Waldron did the exact same thing last year to JSN Jackson Smith in Chigla, uh, where he was not the 
wide receiver in on those three, uh, on those two wide receiver sets, it was Lockett and Metcalf, and so that does not come as a surprise, but that does mean that uh, Cole Kmet may end up finishing this year with more targets, because he'll be on the field more. Um, with that, obviously a lot of talent, all the other guys are more talented than Kmet, uh, but since I have Caleb Williams, and since I know that he's going to be on the field more, I do think that he could have the third most targets, and he's not bad. He's not a bad target end. Uh, so for the backup, it's probably going to be that one week where George Kittle is out, or if George Kittle has been in some sort of slump, you plug and play Cole Kmet. If I'm playing Caleb Williams, I also get that double up opportunity. I really do like this option more with Caleb Williams being a quarterback that's on my roster, since I have that opportunity for the double up, I get double the points. And yeah, that is about it. Then, we've got round 13, running back off the New England Patriots, Antonio Gibson. Now, Antonio Gibson is a copium pick. Um, this was another one where Tom was running out. I didn't love my options, and I ended up selecting Gibson with no real rhyme or reason to it. But since then, I've been thinking, I've been pondering, and last week, Drake May made his preseason debut. In his preseason debut, he played one drive in which he took, like, four snaps, basically. Um, in his passing attempts, he went two of three on passing attempts. It was very underwhelming. They were both dump-off passes to the running back. Um, one was to Antonio Gibson, the other one was to Kevin Harris. Now, when you think about the Patriots wide receiver, not wide receiver, yeah, when you think about their wide receiver room, it's a bunch of young guys and question marks. Kendrick Warren is starting out the year on the PUP list. Then you've got Pop Douglas, um, who was solid last year. Uh, I'll say that for sure. Then you have Javon Baker and Jalen Pope, who I'm hoping they break out, bust out, have a great year. But I'm being realistic. We have not had a 1,000-yard wide receiver since Julian Edelman, and we didn't go out and get any, like, top dog talents. And it's probably going to be, like, a bunch of guys who don't break a 1,000 once again. Uh, so the wide receiver room. It's unproven. I'm not going to say it's bad, but it's unproven. Um, comparatively to the rest of the league, yeah, it's bad. But we'll see. Maybe they can do something. Drake may also unproven, but in the off chance that the offense is not doing well and the wide receiver is not creating separation, the dump off pass is a Patriots specialty in the last two years. We've got Matt Patricia abusing the screen pass and the wide receiver. Uh, dump off passes, and then last year the same thing with Bill O'Brien, and then we just saw the only two throws from Drake May being this, so you figure Antonio Gibson is not going to be the early down back, I think that's definitely Ramondre Stevenson Ramondre Stevenson is also a very adequate pass catcher, uh, but Gibson I feel like would be more in for that third round rule and as much as I personally hate watching it, yeah, the Patriots do love to run like third and fourteenth running back screen. So I'm coping. I'm coping with this pick. I'm really just coping with the team, and I happen to pick someone on my team. Uh, but yeah, it's it's whatever. It's when you're this far down, you have to kind of just take shots on people that you like, and I don't like this pick. <laughs> into the last three picks of this draft. I think I can get through the next two pretty quickly. Uh, round 14, I went with my kicker in Jake Moody of the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, you know, kicker is a kicker. You bet on offense that they're going to score more points. Jake Moody, pretty good consistency. Uh, 49ers, one of the best offenses. I'm fine with it. And then, um, don't invest too wildly in your kickers. I, I would not recommend that. You can pick them up on the waiver wire or if you like someone, take them in your last three picks for sure. Um, and then, after that, one with defense. Uh, I was actually trying to research defense, and then the auto-picker selected Jack 
Sixteenth pick 
fucking effective. They, you don't have to waste it on something you don't like. Like, take a shot on a prospect that you think could be cool. Um, and yeah, as always, you know, draft is not everything. It's nice to have a good draft. It's fun to prepare for it. Do your research and get players that you like. Uh, but it's definitely not even half of what goes into fantasy football. It's more so uh, waiver wire additions and, you know, keeping your roster optimized. Uh, so, yeah, that concludes this 16-pick 12-man PPR draft that I performed. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I feel like, I think Yahoo, or not Yahoo, uh, ESPN, they gave me a B on this draft. I was actually tied for second best. visiting and staying over. 
he's from the UK, he's on summer break, and he kind of just wanted to, you know, change of scenery, he was kind of bored, not doing that much, he's been on summer break for, or he will be on summer break for four and a half months, and so he wanted to go out and do something, I and him and my dad have known each other for a while, um, my dad and his mom have worked together for many, many years, I think since like 2000. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.